Welcome to Bookaholics, the Paris Institute for Critical Thinking's podcast series dedicated to books. In this series, we introduce you to some recent and relevant books, our own books, and obviously some classic books that we just can't stop talking and teaching about. My name is Christoph van Houten, and in this episode of Bookaholics, it is my absolute pleasure to be joined once again by David Cayley. Now, David already featured in our Voices series, and today I am so happy to talk to him about his majestic book entitled Ivan Ilyich, An Intellectual Journey. It is published by the Pennsylvania State University Press and just about a bit more than a month ago. So hello, David, and welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, Christoph. Good morning, or good afternoon to you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> good morning to you and good afternoon here. Now, David, as we are used here in Bookaholics, we always let the author give a first short introduction to the book. You wrote it, so who better than you can tell us what it is about and what you intended to write. And correct me if I'm wrong, although Ivan Ilyich's an intellectual journey might at first sight give all the semblances of being a biography, it certainly is not intended to be that. No, it's not a biography, um, which uh, uh, a genre of which its uh, subject <laughs> strongly disapproved, um, thinking that the biographer's pretension to overlook the life of another uh, is always a presumption. Yeah. But it is a, an, an extensive conversation with the life and thought of its subject. Uh, its origin, that's a probably a dangerous question sometimes because you may not be able to shut <laughs> shut the writer up about it. But um, it, as briefly as I can, um, Illich wrote a lot, but he wrote sparingly. Uh, we may come to some of the things he wrote in a minute, but mm -hmm. his, his writings were occasional, very focused, and there was a great deal that he didn't say. He was in a way, the opposite of the kind of comprehensive thinker who, who spells out in book after book a, a vision. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so when I interviewed Illich in 1988 for the uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, uh, I was quite surprised by some of the things he said, which he had never written about. Mm -hmm. uh, and above all, I was surprised by his assertion that the Western civilization, if we can for now call it that, is a, a corrupted Christianity. It's an yeah. upside down or inside out Christianity. Uh, another way he later phrased it was to say that modernity could be studied as an extension of church history. And this was a, a thought that just <laughs> It really did not fit easily into my mind. I mean, it was a mind blowing, as one used to say. And uh, and as we got to know each other, which was a sequel to that interview, he 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 told me he would be writing about this subject, but he never, in fact, did so for a, a variety of reasons I won't go into now. And so, in the end, I I offered to, in effect take it down as a second radio series. Mm -hmm. And that that was broadcast in 2000 under the name The Corruption of Christianity and subsequently, uh, unhappily after his death, which occurred in 2002, became a book called The Rivers North of the Future. And this was a kind of sketch, an oral sketch mm -hmm. of this large hypothesis about our now worldwide civilization. And it really was a sketch, although a very beautifully drawn and evocative one. He himself stressed throughout that this was, he said, a research hypothesis, that this needed further thought. So <clears throat> from that moment, I knew that I was called to try and think this further mm. and to try and understand his work in the light of this late disclosure to me. So that was the origin of my book that we're discussing. And when I retired from, the, from broadcasting in 2012, I more or less devoted myself to it. And now you have it in your hands. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will 
come back to many of the topics you already uh, highlighted. So I'll, I'll, I'll just take it one at a time. Now, although that we both are perfectly aware of the danger of uh, subdividing people's lives and their thought into different periods at times, and especially when one doesn't have all the time in the world, it is easier to do so. So you speak of various periods or stages in Edith's life, for to be exact. And if you allow me, I will follow you here in our talk today. But instead of, of four, I will reduce them to three. So I will put the second phase and the third phase together. So let us begin with the first period, if you don't mind. And this is the years of his formation and his battle with the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, so uh, Illich came from Middle Europe. His father was, um, as then was, Yugoslavian from a split in uh, Dalmatia on the Adriatic coast. His mother was Jewish, uh, from the Jewish bourgeoisie of Vienna, and he uh, ended up uh, during the war as a half-Jew, exiled to Italy, studied in Salzburg and Rome, was ordained in 1950, and I think very explicitly in order to get away from Rome, where he had been fingered as a future prince of the church, you might say, he was a uh, the man who became Pope Paul VI, uh, Giuseppe Montini wanted particularly wanted him to stay in Rome and you know join the Roman bureaucracy. Um, Illich fled to the U.S. and by various uh, chances became an assistant parish priest, assistant parish priest in a Puerto Rican parish in New York. So at first he was all about the Puerto Rican, the, stand, the, the Puerto Rican migration and this very different style of Christianity uh, stemming from the open air chapels of Puerto Rico, uh, suddenly confronting these fortress churches in New York. Mm -hmm. And so for those four years in the early 1950s, he was about the integration of the Puerto Ricans into the New York church. He eventually ended up living in Puerto Rico as vice rector of the university, um, always promoting what he would write about in the 60s as a new church, a declericalized church, a church uh, open to uh, different styles of being Christian. Uh, and uh, so he was, you know, well, he was first seriously in trouble in 1959 when he opposed uh, the two bishops on the island who wanted to uh, condemn anyone who, who supported the government's uh, uh, plan to have birth control devices available, freely available on the island, which the church opposed, Illich opposed his bishops and was in effect, thrown <laughs> thrown off the island. He then established a, a center in Cuernavaca in Mexico for missionary training, but also it was seen, and he said explicitly that it was subversive of the church's missionary effort in Latin America, which he saw as imperialistic, i.e. trying to impose the American style of Christianity and very much linked to to uh, church establishments in Latin America. So he again uh, eventually offended everyone and in 1968 was summoned to Rome uh, to face formal proceedings of inquisition. Mm. The inquisition was by then called the Holy Office, but it was an inquisitorial procedure which he refused to cooperate with. The following year, his center in Cuernavaca, which by then had grown, it had an ambitious publishing program. It was more or less what then called, one then called a free university by then. Uh, that was put under ban by the Vatican and he finally concluded that he could not get anywhere. He could only, there would just be endless sterile controversy that if, if he couldn't persuade the church he would operate outside the church. So he, in effect, suspended his priesthood. He never ceased being a priest. Um, uh, he, he, but he operated outside the church. Uh, 
Yeah. If, if, from if then on. Just, so if, that was if, that that concluded what you called the first phase, yes. or I called. And, and, and if if I may, may just maybe add two quick questions here, uh, because. Um, you mentioned a lot of, and, and I think these questions are important to understand Dilij as well, as, as you also write in your book. Um, there are many names of cities and many names of countries. You mentioned Austria, there's Italy with Rome, and there's Austria again with Salzburg, then he went to the US, then he went to Costa Rica, then he went to Mexico. So th this is this is somewhat of, of, a, of a continuous pilgrimage, and later on in life he would spend a lot of time in Germany as well. So there's this continuous pilgrimage in his life, and 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 I think this is also important to understand Dilich himself in in a certain way as the pilgrim, somebody who doesn't have a fixed roof over his head, but but also on the other hand as as a sort of of missionary for this new church that you mentioned. And then talking about the new church, and and you can answer that later if you want to we can turn back to this, uh, the, the whole Latin American experience might also be interesting to just comment upon then maybe a second. But, but maybe let's start with the pilgrimage and the missionary aspect, if you don't mind. Well, he, he I think, would have said that this simply was something that happened to him, mm -hmm. that his, his roots were cut, his home was erased, in effect, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so he... He, the exile, homelessness came naturally to him in a certain way, but then, of course, this this is a theme in his in Christianity, uh, going you know, and in Judaism, going back to Abraham's being called out of his place mm. to a new place. So, um, so certainly he was always an exile always a pilgrim uh, and I, I would say he, he made the most of it yeah <laughs> um, and and you know that that was perhaps something that made him uh, open to new experiences he was certainly immediately intrigued by this by the the cultural style I guess I could say of the Puerto Ricans, right? Mm -hmm. And he spent a lot of time then on the island. I mean, he would, in his holidays, go to Puerto Rico and ride around or hitchhike around, walk around from, from little chapel to little chapel, seeing how this went, right? So he always, so that was his, and in Latin America, similarly, before he opened the, the center in Cuernavaca in 1961, he he essentially walked uh, from Chile to Venezuela. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he hitched a ride now and then, <laughs> but he basically just uh, hit the road and to see what he could find out. Mm -hmm. So that was that was his way of of learning. Mm -hmm. um, he was always very curious. Uh, and although he concluded that Latin American Christianity was never what it could have been had it been a genuine encounter with the, the original civilizations of, of, uh, and cultures of Latin America, it was still a distinctive variant of Christianity. And he, he felt that the American church did not understand this and did not respect it. Um, so as a missiologist, as, as one would say, he, he was always uh, in favor of a stance of, of radical poverty of spirit, mm. ignorance, openness, right? Mm. Yeah, but and if, if, if you... If you mention radicalness, and you already also mentioned the subversiveness of, of what he wanted for the church, and one would immediately think, if one thinks of Latin America, one would think of liberation theology. But I think it's important to stress here that he was not a member of this movement and uh, also maybe not the biggest fan of it as well. Or am well, I exaggerating he, here? No, you're not exaggerating, but he was also a founder of it in a certain sense in mm -hmm. that uh, the first meetings at which what became liberation theology um, began to articulate itself and organize itself uh, 
were sponsored by his center. Mm. Uh, so he was very much interested in a, a grassroots mm -hmm. theology. Um, but he was also, uh, I don't know what word to use, conservative, I guess, <laughs> uh, about the, the, the churches being outside politics in the normal mm. sense of politics. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So he was so scrupulous about this that when he went to Puerto Rico, he performed no priestly and became vice director of the university, which he regarded as a properly as a political position. Mm. He performed no priestly offices except in a tiny little uh, seaside village where he sometimes went to say mass. So he was very scrupulous about this distinction. Mm. And insofar as he felt that distinction was lost, in liberation theology, mm. uh, that he, um, then I would, uh, yeah, then he, he was an opponent of liberation theology. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes, that makes sense. Uh, also because he, he didn't, he had the same fight or, or a very similar fight with the hierarchy like uh, Leonardo Boff had, but he never, uh, went away from the church, whereas uh, some of the liberation theolo theologians actually went away from the church because they refused that sense of obedience that I think uh, Illich uh, always remained present in his thought. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now turning to the period of his fame and his uh, great productivity, and I'm talking here about the 70s decade where he wrote a series of highly acclaimed and influential books and traveled the world to lecture on them. But in the first half of the decade, he was also still working at CIDOC, the Centro Intercultural de Documentación that he had founded in 1965, that closed in 1975. And this is probably also the Ivan Illich that people still remember. And it was also the Ivan Illich that I first encountered in my research. So uh, these were also the years that you encountered him, I think, for the first time. Now, could you tell us a little bit more about all this and maybe beginning with Sidok, as most of the publications from that period that made him so famous actually found their source in that center? Well, Sidok was a began from this kernel of missionary training mm. and uh, gradually outgrew it through this outreach to Latin America through a very ambitious publishing program. I mean, they did an astonishing amount of publishing and, mm. and over that 15 year period. And also by becoming a kind of university-like institution. Uh, so it, just to take one example, uh, Illich's book, Deschooling Society began in a series of seminars uh, held at CDOC which involved, you know, most of the well-known radical, can I say, thinkers mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. education of the time. So John mm -hmm. Holt, Edgar Friedenberg, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Goodman, who was a very dear, dear friend, uh, Jonathan Kuzzle, um George Jennison, they all were there. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it became, I think a, a key word was probably alternatives. Mm -hmm. So that seminar was called Alternatives in Education. So a lot of CDOC's work was focused on alternatives to contemporary institutions mm. and ways of doing things and the attempt to define limits. Mm. And that was crucial to all the books he wrote during that period, almost all of which began at CDOC in seminars uh, mm. conducted at CDOC. You, you also in your book, you have a, a couple of, of, of moments where you talk about uh, in, in that period when he, he was so famous that he lectured for six, 700 people and th that you had to uh, ask people to leave because they couldn't enter in, in, into the lecture hall. Now, do you think that it was because at that time he was understood as the word you already used as a radical. And was that also maybe one of the main reasons why he was then also in a certain sense misunderstood because he was also a conservative. Could this combination add up? Well, he was a, 
he was a brilliant man and he was a rare bird of quite exotic plumage mm. so so he quite readily fascinated people mm. uh he had a rather wry amusement i i can remember uh we had in, a group of friends and I who had uh, been involved with one way and another with international development, so-called, had invited him to Toronto in 1970 for a teach-in that we had organized called Crisis in Development, which expressed our growing disillusionment and critical attitude. So I picked Illich up at the airport and it happened that very shortly before he came, the government of Canada had declared martial law after two kidnappings in the province of Quebec done by a, a group called the Front de Libération Québécois. Mm -hmm. And I was a young hothead and uh, all <laughs> my friends were the same and we were very violently <laughs> against this uh, this declaration of martial law and I, I was astonished to find that Illich was highly in favor of it. Mm. He knew Pierre Trudeau mm. and he thought that Pierre Trudeau's excessive, uh, a calculated excess, but excessively strong action was in fact the right thing to do. Mm. Uh, uh, it makes more sense today than it made to me at the time. But I was, I didn't expect this from Illich, right? Mm -mm. I felt I was dealing with a fellow older man, but a fellow radical. Mm. So when we got talking about it, he said, well, you know, a lot of this vogue that I'm having is, is because I'm so antique that I look, you know, I said, I look avant-garde. So the figure that was later employed by the British theologians who invented radical orthodoxy mm. was already uh, a joke Illich was making in 1970 about himself, mm. that he was so orthodox that he looked radical. <laughs> uh, and it was, but I think in fact he was both, and that's mm. the key to the whole. Yeah, this I think so too. Is that he uh, was sincerely uh, grounded in uh, deeply and sincerely grounded in tradition and fully in favor of a, a radically new church mm. and argued unsuccessfully that those two could and should inform each other. Mm. Mm. So yeah. we, we don't have time obviously to talk about all the books that he wrote in this period, but I just want to confront you with, with a, a sentence that you said to me and in and, and the other episode we, we talked to each other and that kind of stuck in, in my head. And, and I think it, it, it goes for most of the books of this period, like the schooling society, uh, right for, un, uh, for useful unemployment, but also for medical nemesis, that what he wrote was a critique so fundamental that it couldn't be assimilated to the system. Do you still stand with that sentence? Because I think that's that's a very good explanation of, of what I encounter when reading Illich. I know in a certain sense I feel he's right, but I would not know how to apply it in a certain sense. Well, he um, yes, I I stand by it. Yes, I think it's true. Mm. Uh, but I um, how to answer that? I mean, let's say first that the critical idea in all those books is first of all that his the very first of the books that were published in 1970 was called celebration of awareness mm -hmm. its subtitle is a call for institutional revolution mm -hmm. so he claimed that political revolution was not of interest mm -hmm. it would be a, a change in the furniture, it would be a change in the personnel, but it wouldn't be a fundamental change in the society. Mm. What needed to change were, were the institutions. Mm. So, and he claimed that all the institutions he examined, which would include education, law, medicine, transportation, notably, um, 
had were were reaching and breaching uh, the point of what he called counterproductivity. Mm. That is, they. I I I think of his model someone along the lines of what Carl Jung uh, also studied, which is that anything pressed beyond a certain point begins to turn into its opposite. Mm. Uh, it that's also I think a, an undertow in the idea of counterproductivity, one that Delitz never really explored. Mm. So he claimed that all that the school system had begun to stupefy that the medical system had begun to generate ill health or at least dis-ease um, and, and that therefore it was crucial to identify the point of balance, the point of limit, the point of sufficiency, right? Mm -hmm. So I see him as pursuing during this period a constitution of limits mm -hmm. uh, and actually attempting to to at least make suggestions about how we would ever identify this mm. point of enoughness, of mm -hmm. sufficiency, of, of where to stop, mm. right? Of, of when permanent habitation begins and endless progress ends, right? Mm. When it's recognized that endless progress is impossible. Mm. Um, so that can't be assimilated, you know, he the called principle. for a disestablishment of the school mm. system. That mm -hmm. That's probably a good way to, to get at it because mm. what does that mean? First of all, disestablishment is a term that has been normally applied to religion, right? Mm -hmm. He was writing in the United States addressing Americans. They knew what disestablishment meant, mm. right? The church had been disestablished. Uh, it, it would not have been acceptable to anybody that membership in a church would be a requirement for access to any public good. Mm. So he said the same thing about education. Mm. So it re that requires you first to recognize that you're dealing with a church, which is still not widely accepted. Mm -hmm. And second, that you could disestablish such a system, make it free, Mm -mm. Well, that sounds libertarian, right? Mm. Is he on the right? Is he on the left? <laughs> you know that, and that was in fact the begate the basis of an incipient Marxist critique of Ellis. And they began to say, "Well, this guy looks like a radical, but he's actually, you know, he's it's just a justification for cutbacks." Mm. I can remember friends of mine arguing with me about that. I mean, we're back in nineteen seventy, so he didn't fit, mm. right? It only makes sense in a new framework. Mm. So that's that's uh, I think that's what you just said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and what makes sense only in a new framework cannot be assimilated. Exactly. No. 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 And what is that? What is a greater source of misunderstanding than that? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, people think that they can apply it. And I think it's the the, the whole idea of the yeah. application in the current system. It's just not applicable. No, no I, 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 and and I always th think of of picked in a certain way as as not applying the educational system in in a in a good way. Then I hope, but anyway, uh, no publicity here. Let's turn to the uh, third uh, part of 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 my question. Then the last period of of of, of Illich, and that happened after his famous or maybe infamous lecture on gender in Berkeley in nineteen eighty two and how his life then made a new, a serious twist and turn. Now, the change of his public fortune, however, it, it, it did not interrupt his work. And I believe, in fact, that it was in this final period of his life that his most interesting work was done. Uh, for me, for example, it's his particular in interpretation of history or his insistence of the importance of the 12th century that I still found of utmost, find of utmost importance. And, and they're actually still open to be further developed. So what can you tell us about the fate of this lecture on gender and then the later work that he... Uh, well, this is highly schematic, but yes. uh, let me make a stab. Illich faced, despite the fact that he was extremely famous and in demand mm. and that he sold some books, 
it was pretty obvious that he wasn't getting anywhere in the sense that none of the things that he predicted were about to happen. And he did actually predict that they were about to happen, like mm. de-schooling or mm. a major house cleaning in the health professions. Uh, none of these things were occurring. So he obviously had to inquire more deeply as to why. Mm. And one of the ideas that became most important to him was the idea of scarcity. Mm. So he came to think that scarcity was, in a way, the anchoring certainty, often occurring below the level of conscious thinking about that particular institution. So if you take schooling, right, mm -hmm. uh, he just defined ed contemporary education as learning under the assumption of scarcity. Mm. So the assumption that the means for this, we can't just get together and, and educate each other. We need, that we need resources for this. Mm. And these resources have to be husbanded inexpensive institutions and access has to be limited and the whole hierarchy is created out of the sense of scarcity as inherent scarcity mm -hmm. is a postulate of economics mm -hmm. you don't have to it, it's always the case whether or not something is abundant temporarily mm -hmm. so he became very interested in the history what he called the history of scarcity and began to explore more deeply in history. Uh, those explorations were uh, recorded in a wonderful book called Shadow Work. Mm. Uh, and then he discovered the women's movement. Mm. And essentially he was astonished to be told by a couple of German historians uh, Claudia von Verhoff and uh, Barbara Duden, notably, that what is normally described as the coming of capitalism could, could as well be described as the demise of gender, mm. i.e. that you can only begin to build something universal in which uh, everyone is the same once you have destroyed this fundamental duality. He became absolutely intrigued. He mm. came to the conclusion that the women's movement was the key to everything, that the radical questioning of the certainties of the modern world would come from the women's movement. And he enthusiastically set to work on this history of, of what he called gender, mm. uh, a term that wasn't widely in use at the time and it wasn't used at all as it is now. In mm -hmm. fact, he remembered going to his publisher in 1980 and being told, Pantheon in New York, and being told, nobody, everybody, that's just the, the, the you know, the, it's, it's, it's a quality of noun. They have gender, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it isn't the quality of people. Mm -hmm. why, why are you talking about gender? So he, <laughs> I think he, in a certain way, he's right that he, he popularized the term, mm -hmm. but he, and a lot of his friends, I think, saw trouble coming. Yeah. <laughs> and and he, he relates this in his book, Gender, that he was warned off and he wouldn't mm. stop. Mm. So when he was invited to do the Alexander Lectures, uh, no, those are in Toronto. The Regents, like, uh, pardon mm. me, the mm. Regents <laughs> Lectures at, the, at, uh, at Berkeley, Berkeley, University mm. of California, 1982, fall. He he just basically let her rip and was, I think, completely misunderstood. Mm. The, the stance of the great intellectual, male intellectual from Europe was all mm. wrong. Uh, the idea that he was exploring church history, economic history, doing fundamental genealogy was missed, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. He was seen as basically uh, in favor of the good old days when, you know, mm. barefoot and pregnant, <laughs> you know, back to the kitchen girls. That like he, really, he really was not given a subtle reading at all. No. Uh, 
Um, and this idea that that uh, some fundamental duality that would that is universal in culture uh, could be understood more broadly, that didn't really get into the conversation. Mm. Um, so after his lectures, a, a journal called Feminist Issues published a special issue refuting Illich. And I think it's fair to say that that book got a fairly evil reputation. Hmm. I certainly, it's certainly ignored. Yeah. It's, it's amazingly ignored. Uh, I've certainly met lots of people who know that they don't like it, although they've never read it. Hmm. Uh, so I think it really... He hit a, re a nerve that was... <laughs> yeah, you would say he, if, if we talked about these two poles before of the radical orthodoxy, mm. he, he suddenly shifted. Mm. His, he shifted from progressive to reactionary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he never was either, <laughs> but he hit the person, and he never lost the ear of some of the European Greens. Mm. Uh, some, you know, there were lots of groups mm. that, that kept uh, their regard for Ivan, and and lots, and to this day, mm. there's there's still. Well, Agamben, I, I think Agamben, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, Agamben published a, 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 an Italian translation of Gender just recently. So, yes, he didn't do the translation, but no, 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 obviously not. But yes, he he was he was instrumental in getting it republished. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So may maybe people can read the book now, 40 years later, and, and, and maybe the acceptance will be a little bit different than 40 years ago. But maybe... Well, what, that, I, I hope you're right, but it hasn't happened yet. Okay. That I know of. Now, I don't, I'm not in touch with Italian intellectual life, and I don't even know how, what reviews or discussions there have been since gender. I mean, that's four years ago now, mm. I think, or five that, that gender was republished. Mm. Maybe it's, it's yeah. the, 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 the water, the kind of bumpy water Agamben is in now might not be helpful for Illich as well. So, but, but maybe let's, let's turn to the later work then after gender. And, and I, I, I don't know if it if it is just me, but every time I read Illich and especially his later more historical work, I can't find the or I can not find it not very similar to Foucault. Like his insistence of of reading the past, but not for the past, but for the present. His 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 idea of of of, of history of, of being as, as of history being able to be read as as a continuum or as a a, a, a constant of social construction, and then also the insistence of the invention or the reinvention of a new art of living. I think these are all topics that are very important for Foucault, and, and they are also all very important for the later Illich. So is this me because I studied Foucault too much and I see him everywhere, which I don't, but uh, I think there's so much in common between these scholars. There, there is, I think, that that is very real. And I, mm. I think they were both aware of it, mm. and and at least on one occasion that I know of, met and discussed it. Mm. Um, but but the the fundamental difference is one is a Nietzschean and one is a Christian. <laughs> I well, I don't want to say that Foucault was a was a Christian, but he made some very fun remarks occasionally that. If he wouldn't have become a philosopher, he would have become a monk. He once said, and also in, in, in yeah, and 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 I think in a certain sense it's it's very similar to Bataille as well. Georges Bataille, who was one of the teachers of Foucault, he started off as a as as a student of of of, of priesthood as well. So I think if if you want to understand the French in the sixties, and we will come now to the main important turn. If you want to understand, I think, the whole of postmodernism, you have to understand the church. And this obviously brings me to the last topic of, of what we can call about. And that is the constants, what we already talked about, what you also wrote in your book with him, Rivers North of the Future. That is this connection between modernity and church history and his famous uh, phrasing, 
of the corruption of optimi quae est pessima, the corruption of the best is the worst. So this is something that he came to later in life, but I think reading backwards almost all his books, I think it's present in, in all of them. Could you say maybe something more about this corruption? Well, I mean, the phrase, in so far as it's a proverb, uh, speaks for itself and, and, and speaks to a universal understanding. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would not question the, the proverbial dimension in that. That this is a way of characterizing Western history is, is perhaps Ivan's most novel idea. And he, he, I would say, claimed that the, that the incarnation, the idea that God could be a person, could be in history available as between two people, whenever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am amongst mm -hmm. them, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, whoever does this for the least of these, my brothers, has done it for me. Mm -hmm. That that radical incarnational side in the Gospels is, is Illich's essential faith. Mm. But he, he sees, and I think probably saw from the beginning, it's extraordinary volatility, mm. right? That is, when the highest is institutionalized, when the presumption begins to be born that this can be routinized, made available, right? Mm -hmm. Then something new is, is, is let loose in the world. Mm. That's, that says it very simply, but, but that is the essential idea, right? Mm -hmm. And this obviously goes in phases, right? From the church taking on a position in the late Roman Empire, uh, dealing with social problems and eventually dealing with all sorts of issues of governance mm -hmm. uh, that were coming up in a failing empire, the, the bishops taking the position of magistrates, etc. Mm -hmm. it, it enters a whole new phase uh, after the 11th century, you know, when you, you the church uh, presumes to regulate the lives of the faithful as, as never before. Um, and I think uh, since Illich first talked to me, I mean, a huge amount of work has been done on this, right, mm -hmm. to, to yeah. flesh out what Illich says. Yeah. I mean, Charles Taylor's A Secular Age is just one example. Um, uh, so then you it goes it goes in phases, right? But his his idea is that it it passes over into the modern state. Mm. So so essentially Christianity is the source of this society, but it is not acknowledged, mm. right? It's mm -hmm. not it's not recognized. Uh, and in, and indeed, uh, a lot of things happen that that make it unrecognizable. Mm. Yeah, the whole idea of secularization as well. It is a it, it yes, and and the idea and, uh, itself is a religious thought too. And people think that it it, it is proclaimed or it it stands for the, the 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 subtraction of religion from public life. When if you look at the term of secularization, it is actually the entrance of the divine into the world. So yes. the whole idea itself is, is also on, 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 on its head. So you were saying that it went into phases, and but then it, it goes in, in, into contemporary life, in, in, into modernity. And how, how does it go then from, from there? How do we take it further from there? Well, I mean, I, you know, he, he says in de-schooling society, for example, right, that, that the essential presumption of the school system is that man can do what God cannot. Mm 
namely manipulate others for their own salvation. Mm -hmm. right? So he identifies that element in schooling, in medicine, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 so to that ex extent, he, he sees it as 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 a church, right? Mm -hmm. But somehow, it's perhaps through the peculiarities of, of secularization, it's not perceived, right? Mm -hmm. So the the over it, what, what is considered as the overcoming is actually the what Illich would claim to be the corruption. Yes, I think that's a fair. I think that's fair. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I okay. would agree. I think he would agree with that. Okay, that's good. Well. Thank you for all of this, David. Uh, I could go on talking for hours about Ivan Illich and even more so when it is with you that I'm talking, but I'm afraid it's time to wrap this up. So thanks again for this. It has been truly a pleasure talking about your book, Ivan Illich, An Intellectual Journey, published by the Pennsylvania State University Press, University Press, which I recommend for everybody interested in Illich to read over and over again. Thanks also to our listeners for having joined us once again for this episode of Bookaholics. And you, dear listeners, if you like our volunteer work here at PICT, you can now also consider supporting us by becoming an active member of our institution. For more information about how to join PICT, please visit our website. My name is Christoph van Houten. I thank you. Bye.